Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rick Calvert. Good morning, everybody. Who's still sleepy? I am. One more day. Unless you're staying for the Web TV Awards, then two more days. One more late night. Um, anybody come to the Podcast Awards last night? Did uh, David H. Lawrence XVII do an amazing job, or what? I mean, last minute, that was fantastic. Um, the photos you're seeing here, um, are you seeing them? No, there you go. Are uh, taken on the photo walk uh, the day before the show opens. So there's so much stuff going on the show, uh, at the show. Um, Aaron Hockley and uh, Denise led this photo walk, and I think there was about 30 people um, who went on this. So next year, if you want to come early and go on the photo walk, um, be sure to sign up for that early. A couple of, uh, I also want to try to thank a couple other people. I'm, again, I'm trying to thank as many people as I can. If, if for some reason I leave you off, I, I apologize. It's not because um, we don't appreciate what you do. Um, one person I see, Dave Hamilton. Thanks for coming out this year, Dave. I really appreciate it. Um, Dave's been around since the very first podcast expo. And Todd Cochran, again, thank you for keeping the podcast awards alive. It's amazing. Uh, Cynthia Sanchez from OS Pinteresting, thank you so much um, for in the front row. Thank you. Um, Lisa Kinsell, actually, who um, we've got Leo coming out in a little bit, but Lisa is the, the woman behind the scenes who kind of makes everything happen. Thank you to her. Um, and thanks again to all of our speakers. Again, amazing job, you guys. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you put into this and the content you give for our attendees. Thank you. We love you. Thank you so much for coming out. For some, so many of you brave in the blizzards, thank you once again. Give yourselves a really warm round of applause, all right? All right. Again, thanks to our sponsors, um, Marshall Silver. <laughs> there is a blog post coming, I promise. Okay? I promise. Uh, Dragon Search, again, Rick, I'm so sorry, man, you couldn't make it. I know you tried everything to get here. Please go by their booth. And um, who's here from Dragon Search? There's one person who made it all by herself. I... What's that? Okay. Anyway, please go by their booth. Dot .me, thanks, you guys. Uh, Academy of Web Television, you guys are all welcome to come to the Web Television Awards tomorrow night. We're going to send you an email tonight. There's a code, NMX214. NMX 14. It'll be free for you guys to come to the Web TV Awards tomorrow night if you want. That's a red carpet event. It's the Oscars for the internet. Uh, Cliff Ravenscraft, Podcast One, Podcasting A to Z, thank you. Norm Pattis, who's coming out in a minute here um, from Podcast One, thank you so much. U.S. Army, again, thank you guys for being a sponsor, and thank all of you, active duty, retired for your service, thank you so much. Uh, and WordPress, thank you. Yeah. WordPress, thank you guys. Um, Somebody, I've heard it several times, said about 90% of the bloggers here use WordPress. Um, so, so thanks, you guys, for being here. Justin TV, thank you for hosting the stream. Uh, New Tech, thank you for providing the gear. And Tech Zulu, Efren, thank you to you and your team for making the stream work most of the time. We really appreciate it. So. The video we just showed is, is from our TBEX event. I've told you guys, travel bloggers are spoiled. That's from the party at the Guinness factory in Dublin in October. Um, they gave us the whole building. It's a six-story building in the shape of a Guinness glass. And the top of the building is a, like where the foam of the beer would be. It's a 360-degree bar view of the city and the surrounding area. Um, it's one of the tallest buildings in the city. It's amazing. And they gave this all to the travel bloggers for free. So I want to be, and they had that band there playing the song in Gaelic, and it was unreal. I want to be a travel blogger. Anyway, all of that said, 
We've got, I think, a great, great opening keynote this morning. Norm Pattis from Podcast One. Um, as I, I mentioned last night, the Podcast Awards, he also started a little company called Westwood One, um, really the pioneer of syndicated radio. And the fact that Norm is now in the podcasting business, I think, is really interesting for all of us here in the room. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Uh, Noah Shanick from uh, Stitcher Radio, also doing some pretty amazing things. And he just told me backstage they have some other major announcements coming this week. So what Stitcher Radio is doing with podcasting, I think, is really important to us. And, of course, Leo Laporte, I call him the, pod, the Pied Piper of podcasting. Uh, Cliff, I know the fanboy is in the front row again waiting. <laughs> uh, Leo hosted the podcast awards for us last, last year. It was so much fun. He wanted to be here yes, uh, last night, but I, he, they just had other stuff going on, a conflict. And he's actually really sick. And he still came because he, he, he loves the community so much he wanted to be here. So please welcome Norm Pattis from Podcast One, Noah Shannick from Stitcher Radio, and our moderator, Leo Laporte from Twit. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Norm. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, there we go. There's a lot of people up there. Well, it's good to see you all. So this panel, I don't know what this panel is going to be about, but it's, uh, it's kind of a great uh, chance to hear from two really important people in uh, new media. Uh, Noah Shanick uh, founded uh, Stitcher as a way to, what, what, what was your plan with Stitcher? A uh, way to make podcasts easier to listen to. Particularly in the car. Discover, and yeah. particularly in the car. Yeah, okay. and you've done that. You brought it to Ford. Who else? Ford, GM, uh, BMW, um, so, some Mercedes cars, and we've got a couple more big announcements this uh, That's exciting. At CES yeah, that's year. great. And I think if you're a podcaster, you're on Stitcher. I mean, that's, you know, it's a must. Uh, Norm Pattis is a legend in the radio industry. He founded the number one syndication uh, company, Westwood One, how many years ago? 30 years ago? 1977. Oh. Wow. Yeah, and I'm I tried to work for him for years, and he never gave me the time of day. But it, it never got to my <laughs> desk, and that was when I was a one-man show. <laughs> but he's also in the Radio Hall of Fame. I mean, what's really interesting to me is that a guy with a with a background in radio would be interested in podcasting at all. Um, well, what's interesting to me is that a guy in radio wouldn't be interested in podcasting, right. since I think it's the future of audio. Right. Right. <laughs> I think a lot of radio, uh, you know, we will, we're going to have iHeartRadio here on the stage, but instead we'll just bash them. It's, it's, it's easy. It'll be easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is Clear Channel's attempt to basically do a stitcher to get their radio content in your car via 3G and 4G and uh, to listen on the web and, you know, kind of aggregate all their streaming stuff. Should radio be afraid of what's happening in podcasting right now? Well, no. I mean, I, I think that radio should be afraid of um, staying the course. Uh, you know, radio listening is not growing anymore. I mean, the beautiful thing about radio when I got into it was that it was a, a, a continuous growth pattern. Every year, there were yeah. more and more and more and more people listening to radio. Well, that's not the case anymore. There are, more, there are many more options. And, um, you know, I, 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 I really can't understand why the traditional radio business hasn't uh, embraced um, uh, podcasting or on-demand radio. I mean, it's just, if you look at what's going on in the, in the television business, I mean, on-demand is changing the nature of, of TV watching. Uh, you know, even, even the awards for great programs are being mm -hmm. um, uh, heavily influenced by on-demand and by cable and mm -hmm. so forth. And I don't see why the same thing isn't going to happen uh, to audio. You need to be able to provide the programming and the content that listeners, i.e. consumers, want to consume when they want to consume it. And I still do a radio show. I work for Clear Channel. I still, uh, and I love radio. I mean, that's how I got in, in the business out of college was radio. And I so love do I. It. Yeah. Um, I think probably radio hates Noah because you are the most direct threat right now to radio. I mean, music, I think music radio has given up, right? Everybody has a, everybody had an iPod or some other form of music that could program their own music, and there's Pandora. But talk radio is the last kind of bastion in the car, and you're, th you're really threatening that directly. I don't know, to, to the extent that um, ra radio uh, is, a, is, a, is a content creator, and they, they're 
the the best audio content creator. They've right. been al around They're for the a pros. long time. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a great partner to them right. because um, we're, we're allowing them to easily, without reinventing the wheel, um, get the content that they're already producing to listeners when the listeners want to hear it. Uh, so um, we've got great partnerships in the industry with radio, but certainly the m moving from AM, FM to, to, to the Internet in, in, in general is, is, is daunting for them. Um, well, it's threatening because they have a business model based on, it's the equivalent of a brick-and-mortar store, right? Uh, a radio station is like a bookstore, uh, and the idea of doing online is threatening to their main business model, isn't it? Can, can I respectfully disagree? <laughs> you know, look, I, I happen to think that, you know, that, that Stitcher is doing wonderful and terrific things. But just like I, I think the iHeart radio model is a failed model, I don't think that radio is where you go to find the best audio programming and the most creative audio programming. That may have been the case many years ago when no single owner of radio stations can own more than five AMs right. or five FMs. Now it's just a handful of companies. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, the five AMs and five FMs. That was in the country, not just in a market. Right. Now you've got, you know, two major radio players, you know, who own most of the major market radio stations um, in the country. And if you don't have some kind of an arrangement with them, you're not going to get your independently produced radio program on their stations. Right. So you can't build a big enough audience to sell to a national advertiser to support what they're doing. So, I mean, you know, when you take a look, um, I, I mean, if you go to iTunes with 250,000 or you go to Podcast One with 200, you'll find a much greater variety of programming than you could ever find on, on local radio stations and certainly as a national source of supply. Some of our most successful programs could never find a home in broadcast radio. I mean, you know, we, we, we launched, you know, uh, Steve Austin, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we launched um, um, uh, Brett East and Ellis. You're not, those guys aren't gonna get on radio stations, yeah. but, yeah. you know, they've got a huge amount of downloads because they've got an audience that follows them, and they've got a fan base, and social media can let their fan base know what they're doing, and then by bringing on guests who have their own social media and promoting throughout a network of other programs, you can build a self-perpetuating promotional machine. Radio can't do that. And I'm still in the radio business. But interestingly enough, you know, one of my shows, Loveline, has three times the audience on demand that it does for a live true? radio show. Yeah, wow. sure. Wow. Yeah. Um, but Love Line started on radio, so I don't think Noah's it's, completely wrong. It's I mean, still on radio. And yeah, and, and some of the most popular content on Stitcher is ra is is tra traditional terrestrial radio content. Sure. From the, from the NPRs of the world to, to the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, um, and 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 now people can can consume it when they when they want to consume it. So it's well, a better mousetrap. Mouse trap. That's the good fit. That's why radio should embrace what we're doing. But in embracing the successful things that are on radio to expand its audience, there's still a tremendous <coughs> opportunity um, uh, to create new programming that will develop its own audience that wouldn't be given a chance to start to. on yeah. radio. Yeah. Wouldn't be given a chance. That's and right. if they turn out to be really successful, it's going to be because of on-demand, and, and right. radio will become secondary. I don't know if radio will become secondary. It's just, it's a growth of the total overall... Oh, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, in fact, I often despair about radio, but I, I think we, it's very common for people to be very black and white and say, well, as soon as, you know, the next thing comes, the old thing's going to die, and well, I don't think it's going to be that way. No, think, not but, at all. What, what, now, if you were Howard Stern, what would you do today? He's a good example. A guy who's got a great personal brand. It's a radio brand. He went to Satellite because, uh, you know, they offered him half a billion dollars. Right. Uh, I don't know how well that's working for him right now. A lot of people said, Howard, you should do podcasts. What would you do today if you were Howard Stern? If I was Howard Stern, I would go to a uh, subscription model uh, podcast, uh, pod, you know, podcast or, you know, a video as well, audio video. I would go to a subscription model 
and make people pay for the content. He's one of the few people who can get away with, with having his content paid for. The Not other, everybody can do that. No, no, very few people can do that. Yeah. There's only one. I'm thinking of Glenn Beck. When Glenn Beck... He's done well, hasn't he? Uh, you know, he's got... Uh, that program probably is generating in paid subscription revenue $40, 50000000 million. Jeez. But you can do that with a, a year? year? A year, yeah, sure. <laughs> wow. Sure. But, but that took a mainstream media starting point before he could get to that point, right? Sure, and he gave up. He was reaching millions and millions right. of listeners and viewers, and now he's got hundreds of thousands. Right. But those are, you know, he's like an evangelist, you know. If you can find somebody who has an evangelistic following, and, you know, which is maybe evangelists, and um, <laughs> we're looking at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and somebody like um, a Glenn Beck, or I think even a Howard Stern, if what they're interested in is purely making money, I think, I think that model works for them. For 99% of other podcasters, um, that's not going to work. Um, but when you find an interesting personality like a Howard Stern, I think people will pay to listen to and watch Howard Stern if that's the only way they can get him. Leo, if I were Howard Stern, I would do an exclusive deal with Stitcher. <laughs> <laughs> Howard. <laughs> um, what, what Norm was saying about Glenn Beck being, uh, he, he's the most entrepreneurial personality uh, that, that comes from ter terrestrial radio and is really embracing uh, the, the, the new medium. Right. And uh, a, lot, a lot of folks could not, or aren't large enough to be able to to, to, to do that um, and, and have the following, but that's the, the model for, um, for, for someone the size of, of Howard Stern. That's the model, or um, jo join forces with, uh, with somebody who's a, who's a leader in the space. Right. And um, he, he was the inflection point between terrestrial radio and satellite radio. That's when, right. When, when, when Howard right. went over, that was a big um, deal. That was the, that was, that yeah. was the pivotal. That was the piv pivotal yeah. moment. And this is the next evolution of, of, of radio. Uh, and, and um, yeah, how would you... Yeah, with Stitcher, I, don't, I left my Sirius subscription lapse. There's nothing Sirius can bring me that I can't get on my phone. That's right. I mean, it, seriously, it doesn't... I, I, I'd hate to be in their business right now. I thought it was a, I thought it was a failed model to from, begin with. from the beginning. Yeah. Because... Well, you know, it's like that old Bruce Springsteen song, you know, 57 channels and nothing on. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's so many ways to get music, you know, on, on demand, uh, you know, through, I mean, you know, Pandora's got, what, a dozen other companies right. that are doing very much the same thing, right. and it's a part of everything. Google that anybody, is, everybody yeah, is. Yeah, you know, I mean, you guys Amazon. are doing, you guys have, have music, access to music. So, some, but yeah. very, very Mostly. focused on... Are you going to stay with words. talk? Yeah, we're, we're laser focused on that. Want yeah. to continue to be the best at that. Yeah. Does, lead, doesn't lead, want to eat the rights fees. Doesn't want to eat the rights fees. <laughs> the, yeah, there is that. Right. I mean, the, the, we, we work uh, more hand in hand with, with, with content partners. I, the, it's pretty clear that the, nothing's killed anything else. There's many models for uh, paying for it, many models for building. I mean, you could have a paywall, you could be sure. subscription. But you could also be advertising based. I mean, there's all all sorts of ways to do this. Well, look there's at crowdfunding Cor now too. Look at Corolla. He uses everything. He's crowd. He, he crowd says equine. He, he, he <laughs> have you have you ever had Mangria? Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> but it's he's he's selling you know a couple of hundred of thousand it. cases of that. Yeah. yeah. I think Norm, aren't you selling it for him? Uh, no, no, that was that was before our deal. We we do now represent him for advertising exclu exclusively. We had to prove ourselves to do that, and we had to own Dr. Drew, uh, you know, to make that work yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Drew said, okay, they're they're cool, they're cool. <laughs> you know, but so you um, you total uh, all of Adam Corolla's representation is through you now for, his ad, for ad advertising, ad sales. Ad, ad sales yeah. Interesting. Do you help him with distribution, production, anything else? <clears throat> we don't really need. To. I mean, he's on our platform, uh, you know. But you know, Adam. Adam, for us, in many ways, um, you know, is we don't make a lot of money off of the tremendous amount of volume, but what, what it was important for us to do was to have him. Right. And, uh, you know, because he's a brand. He, he, he is a great brand. And then when we put him together with, 
with other great brands, right. you know, that were already out there, and now we're producing programs ourselves that, um, is this wood? I definitely I not. Styrofoam, I, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, you know, we want to build a, a platform of, uh, of quality programming that people can go to to kind of short circuit the process of looking around. Actually, I, I, I've been remiss. I should let both of you guys talk about your, your, what you do. So tell me about Podcast One. Well, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple. I mean, the, the story of West, calling it Podcast One was not by accident because it was an easy story to tell in a variety of areas, least of all consumers, really the story of Westwood One to Podcast One, because at my advanced age, I, I didn't really need to do a, a podcasting venture, but I just couldn't understand why nobody was really doing it in the way that we're doing it. And so I decided to um, do it. And uh, you know, I was introduced to a young guy named Kit Gray, who'd been out there representing some podcasts and selling them to advertisers. And, you know, had done a nice job with it. And, uh, you know, we were introduced by a mutual friend. And I thought, geez, this kid reminds me of me when I started Westwood One. And the radio syndication business was very much like where podcasting is right now. No national advertisers bought syndicated radio really? 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe some direct response advertisers. So I just thought, you know, the opportunity was very similar to what it was that I did, you know, when we sort of kick-started um, uh, syndicated radio uh, in, in terms of developing demand from national advertisers. And, uh, you know, this was less expensive to do. Um, and um, even though Westwood One, I didn't have any money when I started Westwood One. You know, I had $10,000 and a working wife. <laughs> you know, today I have more than $10,000, and I no longer have that wife. <laughs> And of course, and she's, she's no longer working. working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. what does Podcast One provide to a podcaster? First of all, how many podcasts do you have? About 200. Okay. And you choose them? Do they yeah. come to you? How does that work? Yeah, well, we've had a lot of people come to us. We would like to keep the list fairly small so that it's a place where a lot of people who have already have a strong social following can come and find, you know, make it simple. But what Westwood One, I mean, what Podcast One and Westwood One did, it primarily, it's a revenue solution um, to generate, we're trying to, and, and so far so good, build demand with national advertisers, Madison Avenue advertisers, Fortune 500 advertisers, the same kind of advertisers that you would see on uh, network television or radio or local television, local radio, in, in order to turn the medium into a medium, you know, that could become, you know, at least a few hundred million and maybe, you know, a billion dollar business when we started in, in syndication. Very small business. Now network radio and syndication is a billion and a half dollar business. Right. What does it take to uh, get those advertisers? What, what are they looking for? Well, first of all, I think they're looking for comfort. Um, you know, we have a relationship that goes back 30 years, I think. Right. Um, they're they don't know the podcast. Who's this guy? I don't, you know. Well, with all due respect to all of the creative people who are sitting in this room right now, y y you guys are the product. You know, I mean, you guys are the creative energy, uh, primarily. I mean, if I asked for a show of hands, I think I'd see a, a very, very large group of people who are producing their own podcast right. sitting in this audience. Right. But, you know... Um, there, there, needs to be, there needs to be kind of an organized industry in order to get serious national advertisers to take a look at us in the way that I think we should be looked at if we want to create, you know, a demand that advertisers feel comfortable with. So, you know, you've got to have the kind of reporting that they expect. You've got to have the kind of billing that they expect. You've got to have the kind of production values that they expect. You've got to have all the things that they expect. And, Normally, that would be paid for by an industry, but since there really isn't an industry, I'm sort of paying for it myself. And it's the model for them is radio. They see podcasts as just another form of radio? Well, I think they see it, and, and the way we present it is we present it as digital audio on demand. Okay. Okay? And which, which allows us to go to traditional radio buyers. Remember, traditional radio buyers are still spending $16, 17000000000 billion a year. The digital buyers aren't spent, they're spending half that much. Right. And the digital buyers are so granular 
that it makes it hard for us to get a decent rate when they start drilling down and saying, you know, we want young mothers, you know, um, with a certain birth defect and only one leg. Right. You know, um, right. You, you know, it's hard to charge a decent CPM for right. those kinds of things. Right. So, Noah, what was the plan when you founded Stitcher? What, and what have you done since? Well, I saw, I, so by, by background, I guess I'm, a, I guess I'm an internet entrepreneur. I, um, I was on the founding management team of, of StubHub, the ticket company. Um, and I started to get really interested in um, audio just personally. Right. Uh, I started a podcast, um, hired a comedian, um, started a podcast just for fun. It was basically like a... America's funniest home video, but for audio, people That's would awesome. like send in funny clips, and um, and and uh, listeners would vote on the best clips, and then and, and we'd make a show out of it. Um, and and I, I realized that there was already all this great content out there in podcast form, from um, large radio to to uh, long tail shows about everything under the sun. Um, but but it was it was very difficult to uh, d deliver the content, and uh, it was very difficult to find the content that that you want. I remember being on the the phone with my mom late one night and trying to to explain to her how she could listen to my my radio. Yeah, it's show. too hard. Yeah, and it was it, it yeah. was it was in, you know it was impossible. You're downloading it and syncing and 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 um, so. Uh, I, I was an early adopter of Pandora. I saw with a two-way internet connection um, how much better a, an experience can be, a listening experience can be, um, and, and, and how much more personalized it can be. I was also inspired by the number of people that actually went to the lengths that they did to listen to podcasts back in the, the iPod days. It, it, was it was a clear signal to me of, of how important personalization Right. actually is to people. Right. So um, a lot of it was a, uh, a bet on the timing of the mobile internet um, and, and a bet on the timing of um, the automotive industry embracing um, a, a connected car. You saw your future is in car, pretty much. 50% of radio listening yeah. is in car. Is in car. Um, and and yeah. the morning commute is all talk. Right. Um, and, and so uh, we, we knew that that was, um, that, that was necessary for us. So. Um, we, we, we set about to create uh, an on-demand internet radio company that focused on spoken word, news, talk, and information. Um, and what we believed to be the most important things was uh, e easy d delivery of content so a listener can just press a button and start to listen, uh, and it learns from you. And, and, um, and then, so the, the second part is recommending shows that, that you, you may also like. Right. Um, and, and so it, it, expanding the universe, we have 20,000 uh, podcasts on Stitcher right now. So, so finding the ones that, 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 that you want is, um, is, is, is not trivial. And, and then finally, so, so we're most popular as an app now, 12 million downloads, um, and um, we're the, the, the largest distribution platform of podcasts on Android and second largest on, um, on uh, the iPhone behind, um, be, be behind iTunes. iTunes yeah. but, but the car has been, um, uh, ha, ha, has, has been the, the long-term goal. So we were the, the first ones to, to announce alongside Pandora with Ford at the Consumer Electronics Show um, a, a few years ago. And, and basically the dam broke. All automotive companies re realized that this was um, that that th this was the future, and that people wanted um, they, they 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 wanted in the car what they were already listening to that that was in their pocket uh, through 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 a mobile device. And having an internet connection in your pocket on the go uh, was 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 one of the keys to that. So fast forward to where we are now. Um, I, in 2013, there were um, 150 million plus podcasts downloaded on Stitcher. Um, we're in, we're, we will be in, there, there will be over 4 million Stitcher-enabled vehicles um, in 2014, and, and uh, um, we're, we're... And how do you make your money? It's, it's an advertising model, uh, so similar to Pandora or to, to, to terrestrial radio, and, um, but we were, we're able to deliver a lot more value uh, especially as, as, as we get bigger in terms of, of things like um, f frequency cap it, capping, 
uh, which, which terrestrial radio listeners are not used to, and it becomes less invasive. B better targeting, um, better analytics, we still as an industry need to figure out what that measurement is uh, and, and, ha and, and have a standard measurement. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's an advertising-based model. It does seem like one of the things to be mature industry podcasting needs is metrics. Yep. Both of you have mentioned that. Yep. Yep. Uh, now radio has Arbitron, TV has Nielsen. What is uh, what is podcasting at? Well, now everybody has Nielsen. There is no more arbitrary. That's right. You know, everybody has Nielsen. They'll have people meters. Yeah, you know, there, there's a variety of different uh, uh, companies that measure uh, that measure podcasts. Um, you know, the ones that you're probably the most familiar with, you know, are, are Libsyn, uh, who's been around a long time and does a good job. Um, then there's um, Raw Voice. Uh, uh, with their Blueberry uh, application, um, PodTrack. Uh, th there, there's a lot of different ones, but all, all of the technology is proprietary. Yeah, we use PodTrack numbers, and you, yeah. you told me we shouldn't because it's too low. I, I, I didn't, <laughs> yeah. All, all, I all I said was, you know, that's mostly, from what I understand, a measurement of uniques. Right. You know, and... Well, what we found is, though, ultimately, it, what it comes down to is a value proposition for an advertiser. Those well, sure. numbers are meaningless. As long as the advertiser is getting the results they want, the return on their investment. Well, yeah, the, the, but the, with a Madison Avenue advertisers, they don't know the return on investment. They can't tell. Within, you know, a multi-million dollar ad campaign. Pepsi isn't going to know. So they need to be comfortable that the numbers are going to be right. Right. You know, uh, you know, Noah was talking about building the platform. You know, we're, we're a little bit different, and that's where measurement is very important to us. We don't care how many different platforms our programs are available on. Um, you know, at some point, we'll start focusing on building out the Podcast One platform so that it's the place that people go. But right now, that's, that's not what we're well, focused on. Well, the beauty on. of podcasting is you can get it in a variety of different ways. Sure, as long as you can count the, you know, count the downloads. I mean, but that's right what now, makes it hard, though. That's yeah. right. Well, but if you take a look at the downloads that we're generating monthly right now, on the 200 podcasts, it's in excess of 100 million downloads. Right. So monthly. Now, now the, the question is, w w what, what is the download really? Uh, but everybody measures differently. I mean, if you go to SoundCloud, they don't measure download, downloads per se. They measure something else. And, and, then, and if you go to a variety of different mediums, they measure in different Ways, but what you have to remember is all of these measurements are estimates, okay? Whether it's Nielsen or it was Arbitron before it, where there's traditional radio, whether it's uh, traditional television, network radio, network television, there, and, and also a, a lot of the digital. I mean, it, you know, it's as, it's as credible as the company that is putting out the numbers. You know, if Google puts out a number, people believe it, you know? If Joe Schmo puts out a number, you know, a buyer's going to want to see, you know, more stuff to back it up. But um, the one thing that we know, that all three of us know, is that direct response advertisers love podcasting. And they love podcasting because it generates leads and acquisition uh, uh, for, for, for their products. They can measure the effectiveness of a single announcement of a single spot in all of the programs that they purchase. And that message, along with metrics that give comfort to advertising agencies, has to be the nature of the presentation that you take forward to the big advertisers to say you're crazy not to do this. Is it ever going to coalesce, though, into a single system that everybody knows and trusts, as it is in television and radio? Yeah, as long as, as long as people understand that they're audience estimates. Right. You know, I mean, we're working on that right now. We're working on that with Edison Research. Um, you know, I worked with that back when I was um, um, in the, broad, the U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors. I was appointed by President Clinton and reappointed by Bush. So I must have been doing something right, because um, those two guys don't usually agree <laughs> on a lot of things. 
But when I was doing broadcasting in the Middle East, setting up Middle East broadcasting in Arabic of all things, you know, I brought um, Edison Research in and Nielsen to do market research in all, you know, 22 countries of the Middle East. And they were able to put together credible ratings information there. You know, if we can do it in 22 countries of the Middle East in Arabic, we ought to be able to figure out how to do it here. What is the response of advertisers uh, today to podcasts? No, what, what kind, when you go out and pitch Stitcher, what, what, what kind of response are you getting? We are, uh, so, so, so we pitch it, uh, we, we go in a different door um, than podcast one. We, we go in the, uh, the, the, the digital door right now. And so we are, um, we're, we're, we're mobile. Um, and advertisers are looking for things that are safe and mobile because this is the, you know, we're still in sort of the wild frontier from a mobile perspective. Um, and we're internet radio, so we're, we're, we're competing with the, 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 the Pandoras of the world. Um, they are very enthusiastic about the fact that one, it's uh, Stitcher's brand safe um, and aligned with, um, with, 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 with really strong brands, and, and two, that there are, um, th there are th things you can do uh, on, the, on, the, on the spoken word side in terms of um, audience targeting based on what we know the, the listener is listening to, based on what their interests are. So you actually are tuning what ads are being played? Yes, Depending on what the we, we doing. can. I mean, we, we, we need, um, we're, we're, we're nowhere near Pandora's size, so the more size we have, obviously, the more that we, we, we can target. Um, and, and, but but that's, that, that's resonating with them. And then the third thing, as, as, as we all know and as terrestrial radio knows, is, is relative to music, Spoken word is a, is a much more lean forward experience. The, 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 the listener is not only heavily engaged in what they're listening to, they're generally doing, you know, they're, 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 they're doing something else and their mind is totally free to, 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 to listen. It's not like m music, it's, it's sort of playing in the background. They also connect deeply with, um, w with the hosts. And, and the more long tail the content, the more they connect with the hosts. And one of the reasons that uh, the, the DR side has been so effective um, so, so, so far is because it, a, a host that you love, that you follow, that, that, um, that m maybe many people don't know about, um, if they're, if they're uh, asking you to, to buy a certain thing, you're probably going to do it. Right. So that, that DR is direct response. DR is dire direct response. So that's response, where they say call this number right now and uh, order today, and they can measure the effectiveness of the ad directly. That's right. Because, and, and, but we are focused more on as brand. opposed to drink more Pepsi because you're hip and with it, which and you can't is, measure. Right. So spoken word hosts works well with this direct response. It works well with direct response. We are focused more on brand because there's there there um, there there's a lot more. D DR is the, the first step in the opportunity, and there right. there's a huge amount of brand opportunity. Ultimately, out there. brand is where the growth is going to happen. You, That's right. typical in a new medium. You start with direct response, but you move to brand as you become more established. People trust you more. And you said digital. What's the difference between digital and a traditional media buy? What it, you're working with a different part of the ad agency. Yeah, yeah we're going into the um, the we're going in for the same dollars that's buying banner in, ads, internet and, radio. Okay. Um, they're they're uh, they're buying mobile. They're 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 buying they're they're not not the ones buying radio. Right. Uh, See, we've made a conscious decision to go with the traditional buyers. Why is that? Because we think we offer them a value proposition. There's there's competition within the agencies themselves and at the client level between traditional media buying and digital media buying. And we think that we offer traditional media buyers a digital solution that, that, uh, that gives them something to be able to compete effectively with within their own, um, within their own operations. It, it's, it's sort of like the first people who became interested in what I was doing were talent agents. You know, um, Why? Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I've been sitting courtside at Laker games for the last 30 years. There's eight seats between the Laker bench and the scores table. Four of them are mine, and four of them belong to the William Morris Endeavor Agency. So Ari Emanuel, 
uh, sits next to me, and I was, <laughs> I was telling him what I was, what I was getting ready to do, and he said, you know, that sounds really interesting. Why don't I put a meeting together? I'll get my guys together, my team. Why would they, why would established big stars be interested in Because this everybody's looking, the agencies are looking for digital solutions for their client base. You know, their, their client base is, is, has gone way beyond just movie stars and TV stars. We're getting their YouTube stars right. coming in. We're talking right. to them. We're getting, uh, you know, people... Are they hedging their bets because they think this is the... F you know, they're worried this is the future, or, I mean... You, you got to be there. You I just mean, have to be. You the, have to be the, the, younger, the younger the clients that they have, the right. more personally involved, you know, in online and, and in... It seems that everybody's trying to figure this out. Ab like, what's ab going on? Absolutely. And right. this is a simple solution to take somebody... And plus, you know, you, you take a look and you think, why is it that, you know, when you take a look at, at iTunes, you know, at, 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 the, uh, at the measurements that I... To the rankers and what have you, that, that comedians do so well. Right. Well, they were sort of forced into it. I mean, there, isn't, there aren't very, comedian, and very many comedians that are working today that haven't been screwed by a club owner at one time or another. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, they got into it not so much to make money. They got into it initially to promote their club dates merchandising, all kinds of things. Then all of a sudden... If it was part of their marketing endeavor. Exactly. Now it's a revenue source. Now it's, now it's a revenue source. And, um, and, and, you know... In fact, people, Mark Maron, who's a very successful podcaster, right. really has made a career now as a TV show based on podcasting. Absolutely. And you're going to see more and more of that. You know, one of the things that we're thinking about doing is we're thinking about opening up what we do to a larger group of podcasts, maybe not the ones that are currently delivering big, big download numbers, but, you know, maybe call it the Podcast One Underground and make it available so that people can come in and sort of sample what's out there and see if it builds organically so that it can move up to the main platform and be saleable to national advertising. At its peak, how many shows did Westwood One have? Oh, God. Not 200. No, well, when you consider the fact that Westwood One was um, the mutual broadcasting system, the CBS radio network, well, maybe you did NBC have. radio network, maybe you did have two we had 3,000 employees. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, uh, it, so this it, is very much like Westwood One with a it, different delivery system. And it's, it's, it's like the Westwood One programming side of the business in its early stages. And the numbers, even the revenue numbers, are almost spot on for the first three years of what Westwood One was. Now, I think a lot of people here probably, I don't know, it, I've been in the podcast expo since, since the very first one, and it wasn't about money in the first one. It wasn't about money in the second one. It started becoming a little more about money in the third one. I'd hate to think that podcasting has suddenly become about how can we monetize, how can we make money at this. Um, you know, a guy said to me one time, a guy that I respect who's in the, uh, who's, who's a lawyer, he says, you know something, Pattis? He was a New York lawyer. He says, you know something, Pattis? When they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, look, I mean, I, I, I've, worked, <coughs> I've worked with talent for 30 years, and I know that there are certainly people, you know, especially in the music business when we started out, okay? A lot of people in the music business, especially back in the old album rock days, you know, they weren't going to sell out, they weren't going to do this, they did it because of the love. But just as soon as they get exposed to money, it's amazing what a change <laughs> take, takes place in their life. You know, that's the reason why we want to hook ourselves up with creative people who are interested in the product and let them be interested in the product and let us worry about the other stuff. There you go. Because I think that's why people like me are attracted to podcasting. It's the freedom, the creativity, the chance to do something different and unique. Um, and yeah, I guess if you can make some money while you're doing that, well, it's not it turned such a bad out to thing. be a good business, didn't it's it? It's not such a bad business. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it develops out of passion. But it has to start yeah. at, with Star the passion. Starts Absolutely. with passion, but yeah. um, after uh, after so much time, you need to eat. So, right. Uh, and right. and it could stay a hobby, or um, at, at, as we're seeing, this is an industry transformation. But it does feel like there is a, a, a growing gulf between the hobby podcasters, of which there are thousands, tens of, maybe well, hundreds of thousands, we know from iTunes. And then people who have decided this is going to be a, a career, a business, uh, and those are a, it's a much smaller number. Yeah. yeah, but it doesn't eliminate the hobby podcaster from the marketplace. As a matter of fact, I think it gives the hobby podcaster a possibility that maybe what they're doing could catch on. I right. mean, when you take a look at the viral nature of the business, you nobody can really predict 
that's what right. people are going to go out and find interesting. You never know. And that's, that's, uh, that's the great thing about um, and why we put so much emphasis on, on the recommendation engine and on the rankings is that discovery uh, it gives, is so yeah, important. Discovery and it, it gives it gives shows the opportunity to actually be be found and um, and for them to thrive on their own merit. Do you think a good show will be discovered? Absolutely. If we're if we're doing our job, a good show will be delivered. Will be discovered. And that happens kind of in a snowball effect. Gradually, you accumulate listeners and more listeners. They tell other listeners. Is that how? It there's that, and then there's mechanisms for, for, for Stitcher anyway. There, there are mechanisms within the platform. Um, you like we, this, so you might like that. You like this, so you might like that. We also have, um, you know, fastest trending shows. Right. And so, so if, if, um, if a show c catches on, um, we, we help it to gather momentum. Do you find, Norm, with advertisers that there are some shows, even if they're as an audience for that show, that they won't touch? Absolutely. Sure. You know, if there's a little E next to it, you know, on uh, you know, on the uh, Apple, uh, you know, in, in, in iTunes. Explicit, there's a, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of advertisers who don't want to be in explicit programming. An interesting case. W one of our most successful, you know, because what we're doing is we're producing more and more of our own podcasts. Um, that's an economic reality. We have to be able to produce more and more of our podcasts uh, as opposed to represent uh, other podcasts because we can make more money if we own the podcast right. as well. And with the money that we're having to spend to... Are you looking for talent? Are you going out and... Talent, of course. Always. Developing talent? Always, really? always. Interesting. You know, we launched Stone Cold Steve Austin, mm -hmm. okay? Because I thought that the, the wrestling space had a, you know, a, a group of rabid fans. That's what you're looking for? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, we went engaged, out. Engaged. Yeah. You know. We yeah. launched him, and you know, immediately, you know, hundreds of thousands of downloads. He's cracked a yeah. million, you know, a few times. NPR kind of numbers. Yeah. But you know, when he not does, NPR kind of program, but <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, you know, but uh, but we make sure we have enough NPR. Uh, uh, programs that we represent, even though it's non-exclusively. Well, in a way, that's what you're that. offering in advertisers, and and YouTube with Stitcher is kind of a safe place to be. Is why YouTube is difficult that's because right. you don't know what yeah. you're going to be on. That's right. Right. Well, they're they're not going to get hurt on our platform if a particular show starts to underdeliver. I got 199 other shows that can make up that audience. Right. So, in the case of Austin, as I was saying, and and the little e. You know, every other word in Steve's show was uh, motherfucker, you know. <laughs> now we well, have to you, put an E on this. That's right. Yeah. You know. Now this show can't be on Stitcher. Then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you not have explicit content? We, we, we do. I got a lot of shows that can't be on Stitcher. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we do have explicit content, but we, uh, we have a way to filter it out. Yeah. Well, well, we have a creative way to filter it out. What we did is we had a conversation with Steve, who was an extremely bright guy. And I said, look, you know, I know you can work clean. You did it in wrestling for, right. how, you know, for, for 20 years. Right. So why don't we do this? Why don't we do a clean version of your show once a week? And why don't we do Unleashed once a week? Ah. So now, so he gets on the air and he talks to his audience. And he says, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm out there and I'm, I want to talk to the working man. I want to talk to families. And I don't want you to have to run your kids out of the room. Right. Okay? Right. So we're going to do a family-friendly version of this show so you can keep listening to Steve Austin. But all of you other, guy, all of you other guys who want to listen to it in your man cave and get a little crazy, you know, on Thursdays we're going to do Steve Austin Unleashed. That's smart. And, you know, so now we can sell the, uh, the E-rated version and right. the family-friendly version. Those and there's are probably people who want the E-rated version. Absolutely. And they're yeah. both doing really, really, yeah. really well. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that you, do you have a separate channel for explicit, Noah, or? No, it's by, because for, for instance, in Is the Is it comedy, the same concern that people will be listening and hear an expletive and their kids will get upset or? Yeah, I mean, there's there's that concern in in in, in any me media. Uh -huh. uh, so um, we I just know a lot of podcasters did it so that they could say those words. That's right. <laughs> and, even, and, and, and even there's Howard no Stern FCC. On, on Every, yeah. Right on satellite radio, Howard Stern Same went there. For the, well, yeah, and the, and the 
and the half a billion dollar paycheck. But yeah, yeah, that he helps. Does. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we, by, by show, we basically classify it as right. explicit or non-explicit. And do you notice in listening patterns that there's a difference? I mean, do, do, do explicit shows not do as well? No, some, some of them do, do great. Do I mean, the whole, the whole comedy the genre, around, yeah. I mean... Uh, comedy is often explicit, a, a lot of these. Uh, and uh, Mark yeah. Maron's show is called What the Fuck. Right. Yeah. So, well, WTF, and it does really, right, yeah, yeah, WTF. Yeah, but, yeah, we know what know, it means. We know what the F, yeah. we, we know what yeah, the F stands yeah, for. Yeah. Um, so, and and th those shows, shows do great. There's only a certain subset of advertisers that are going to be interested in that. Right. And, you and should we, try an explicit show and see how your numbers It's skyrocket. interesting because we decided, <laughs> we, any, we decided, well, we decided not, for that, for that reason, we decided to make it family friendly because I didn't want people not to be able to have their kids listen. I wanted people, and because we're coming tech, technology, I thought people would want maybe their kids to listen to a technology show. But it's hard, you know, we're live now all the time not to, the fleeting expletive is yeah, but Leo Unleashed? You don't think I there's know. a market for, for Leo Unleashed? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Really? <laughs> late night. I always want to do a late night show. Yeah. Can we get an exclusive on that? Yeah, you got it. Hey, it was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, neither of you do video, right? Uh, well, we do a little bit of video to augment what we do, but we're primarily audio. And Stitcher's I, audio. We, we don't do video at all. We yeah. think that the li listening paradigm is, is fundamentally different, and we're focused on the uh, audio experience. So did I. And, uh, but I. and the reason we started doing video is because video gets a lot of attention. Yeah. And, um, and then the other reason we started doing it is because we wanted people to be able to, it's a different model, to tune in and watch live at any time. Yeah, but since the primary method I mean, you know, 70% of our, we've, we've done this across our platform, 70% of our consumption is mobile. Yeah. And it's because of this. Yeah. So, right. and this is audio, this isn't. It's, it's this in isn't the car, probably, It's in the car, right? well, yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I drive between Santa Barbara and, and, and LA twice a week, and all I'm doing is listening to podcasts. And it's so easy that, you know, I mean, look, I, I believe that the Indas solution and deals with car companies are very important. But, you know, this, uh, is, like I said, 70% of our audience consume this. You know, you're on Stitcher, right? I mean, your stuff's on Stitcher, right? Yeah, some of our stuff, I think, yeah. is on yeah. Stitcher. Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason why I wouldn't. No, be. no, we want our stuff everywhere. That's so the beauty of podcasts. Just, just as long as we're the only ones who can sell the inventory. Right, right. I, I don't care. I don't care where it is. And, and that's not exclusive. I mean, I'm not the exclusive rep, rep for the NPR shows. But we like to have them there because it's a good sure. place for them to be. But, but most of the shows that we represent, we're the exclusive um, advertising sales representative. And of course, on all of our owned and operated, we are. Because we want to be able to walk into an advertiser and say, here it is, you know, and most of this stuff you can only buy through us. Is, uh, is all your stuff CPM cost per thousand? Is that how you bill people or is... <clears throat> yeah, you know, it usually has something to do with the rate structure, <laughs> you know. It's loosely based well, on the number of impressions. It depends whether they're gonna, they want you to, you know, show them uniques, whether they want you to show them, you know... So um, you de it sounds like you deal a lot. Absolutely. You go in and you say, Let's, there's no structure here. Let's, what do you want? Well, we How don't, can we make we it don't work? exactly go in and do you have say a rate there's no card? structure. Yeah, sure, we have a okay. rate card. But you but work off the rate card a lot. It's a negotiation. I mean, right. when you go in to sit down, I've been doing this for 30 years. When you go in and sit down with a media buyer, that media buyer's job is to pay as little for it as they can. And your job is to make And them our pay job much. is to, you know, get as much as we can for right. our, you know, most of our deals are partnerships with our producers. Yeah. They're equity owners. They own the program. Right. You know, and we're involved as long as we produce. Right. You know, uh, produce revenues. How what? do you do it, Noah? CPM? C CPM, but what we were able to do so many unique things that we can get away from. I mean, they're sa same thing, loose CPM, but we're able to get away from it by doing things like, um, do doing things that you can do interactively. Value add. Who do you think is going to be MVP of the Super Bowl, sponsored by, and you can vote right on the phone. Well, I mean, cool. These are things you can do. Um, yeah. That, that you could never do before. Yeah. And, and, and those things are cool, and, that, and it's a huge part of what we need to do. And I mean, it's almost, I mean, you are so brand, you are so unique in what you do. I mean, you're kind of a 360 sort of package in your right. own space. You, you deal with all of the sponsor needs. 
That's fine, but it will only take the business so far. If the business wants to become a billion dollar business so that podcasting can offer tremendous opportunities for everybody who's sitting in this room, whether they just want to do it as a hobby or whether they want to do it as a living, then it's got to be a much bigger business. And you got to start doing business with people who may not be interested in building the brand through the personal association with the podcast. They just want to meet, they just want to be out there and cover every base and cover all of the people. And we have to show them that our consumers are worth being part of that mix. In fact, they may be the most important part of that overall mix. It seems to me that as they look at their mainstream advertising dollars and try to figure out what the efficiency is of it, and then they compare it with the efficiency of podcast advertising, that that's in podcast's favor, is it not? Absolutely. Has to be. And the yeah. kind of interactivity you can offer, Noah, cannot be offered in one way traditional media, radio or TV. That's right. So uh, those things are unique. It's a unique proposition. Absolutely. And ultimately, is it, does it mean that podcasting can take a lot of that advertising dollar away from mainstream media? Well, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think that podcasting was going to grow while traditional media was going to do no better than remain flat to, to maybe, you know, arc, arc downward. And you think I'm crazy to do video? No, I don't think you're crazy to do video. I think... Uh, I don't think you're crazy to do anything. I mean, look at you, you're doing great. You know, that's uh, that ain't crazy to me. I mean, it's expensive. I, <laughs> it's complicated. The video. I mean, I look. We stream Loveline. Loveline yeah. is on the radio every night from 10 to midnight. We're now podcasting Loveline, and we stream Loveline live every night. You know, there's something about video. live I really like. Stitcher. You don't have a live component. We we we've have you looked at moved that? away from we we've dabbled in it a bit, um, but we have really wanted to be focused on the best, on being the best in on demand, on demand yeah. and and audio and yeah. and spoken word. Yeah. And See, we've here's, got what, here's what you can't do live. You can't pause. That's right. You know this. We're radio with a pause button. Yeah. And a, a start and, when you want button. Exactly. Yeah and a consume it when you want button. I th there are certain things that we will never be able to do that have to be done live. News, sports, things that require li live interaction. But you can still have your interaction with your audience by simply letting them know through social media when you're doing the program, right. if they want to call in and or if they want to use social media to communicate with you. Even news, news is very popular on Stitcher. Um, and some of the news providers are putting out news every 10 minutes. And we it's have almost a, live. It's, yeah. it's almost live. And if, if it's, everybody wants to know when it is live, everybody wants to know. They, they have this feeling of, of safety that if, God forbid, aliens invaded the planet, they You'll would know it. immediately. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and we're able to provide that for them in the form of, um, of, a, of a breaking news alert. If there's a breaking so news you alert do do that, okay. and, there's, and they're listening to some, something else, as soon as the yeah, aliens right. invade the planet, they get the That's they get a good the way message. to Can I make a little personal aside here? Yes. You're a much better looking man in person than you are in that picture. It's a terrible picture. <laughs> you know, you're a much, I would, I would do something about that picture. <laughs> what about mine? That's Actually, I would do something about that picture too. Yeah, well, I, I guess. Think I you're better. Way. You're, you're way better looking. For radio. You're, you're way better looking. Now I, my I, picture. I, here's, what, here's why we do what we do uh, live and video, is I feel like there's a shift in how people consume content, from this notion of wanting to hear every word to wanting to have, and I hope it's not background content like music but to want to kind of uh, dip in and out of it like you would the Today Show, for instance. And so what we're trying to do is produce content that is a river of content that you don't need to pause because there's just always more. And I, you know, Twitter's like that. A lot of, a lot of uh, content that, th that people are getting used to is like that, where it's just, you, I used to try to read every tweet that had happened since I'd been there. You quickly give that up. And you just treat it as a kind of a, a real-time feed. 85% of our audience on our platform consumes the podcast at the actual time of the download. Um, so basically, they're not downloading it. They're just listening. They're streaming it, it yeah, basically. Yeah, really. Yeah. You know, so they want it. 
Uh, and, and that's what happens when you get podcasts that are personality or subject matter centric. Right. That, that are very important to the fans of those people. Yep. That's why we like to start out, because we don't spend any money advertising, because I don't think we have to. Well, now tell me about that, because uh, what kind of marketing does podcasting need to do? Why don't you have to? Well, because I got 200 podcasts with a loyal group of followers for each one, which probably represent at least 100 different communities, okay? So if I'm going to take somebody who has a strong following already, we're going to let their fans know that they're going to have a podcast. Then we're going to be selective about the people that come on as guests and so forth on that podcast, and hopefully they'll have a strong social media. So that's how you market it. As well, yeah. And then we promote it right. in all of the other podcasts. So it becomes this sort of self-perpetuating promotional machine. But let me just say this. There's a lot of times you put a guest on who has no social following simply because it's the right guest yeah. for that program, yeah. or you deal with a subject matter simply because it's the right thing creatively to do. You can't get in the way of the creative process, but you can do a few things that we've all learned over the years that will generate audience awareness. Yeah, we do that too. We, the know. people we bring on the shows very often have their own communities, sure. and it's a way of merging uh, two communities. We put Kathy Lee Gifford on the air because she's on <laughs> she NBC. She has a podcast? Yeah. Yes, What's do, Kathy Lee's podcast? It's, it's Kathy Lee and Company, and she interviews a whole bunch of people. She's interviewed... Uh, How interesting. Her first show was with Regis Philbin. Her last show was with uh, Chris Jenner. Now, you know? that, now, her demographic is, def is not definitely not what you traditionally think of as a is the podcast market. It's uh, housewives. It's older housewives. We're not worried about what it has been. We're worried about what it's going to be. That's right. And, and the, the wider it gets, the better. <laughs>